Welcome to Spirit Skies and how to publish a youth comic in the age of COVID-19. My name is Timothy Stiven and the coordinator of the Envision Conservatory for the Humanities at Canyon Crest Academy. Let me introduce to you this group of highly creative students. The writers and editors are Natalie Feldman, Justin Wong, Hannah Wentworth, the artists are Michaela Chang, Grace Chin, and Riley Sullivan. The students who will be continuing have not graduated. Some of the, those seniors have just graduated a week ago. Those who can continue will be John Asta, Josh Charette Collins, Francis Chai, Sarah Goltz, Alex Reinish Goldstein, and Izzy Stir. And a special guest is live is Giovanna Agrazal from Panama, who is also a member of our team. Hola, Giovanna. Hola. Hola. So, Canyon Crest Academy is a full service public high school with 2,600 students. Along with 20 varsity sports, the Envision Conservatories have all the applied and performing arts as a three year application and audition based program. The Envision Conservatory for the Humanities focuses on philosophy, theology, ethics, and civics in a project based format. And this is how this collaboration began with the Envision Visual Arts Program. The origin of this story actually began five years ago when a science teacher came to us and said, why don't you guys come up with a project that could redesign the children's zoo? So we looked at that idea and we said, let's divide them up in four different biomes. So you have the Arctic, the temperate, the desert, and the tropical zones, and the animals could be in these different enclosures. And there would be one connective animal, and that animal would migrate through those four zones. And the animal we chose was the Rufus hummingbird. So we went to the San Diego Zoo, and we said, what do you think of this idea? And they loved the idea, but what they said was, we need $20 million in 20 years. And we looked at ourselves and we said, that is not gonna happen. So the kids said, what can we do? What can we do? And they said, let's make a comic that does the same thing. So we took this idea of environmental stewardship and the migration of the hummingbird, and that's how Spirit Skies was born. Justin, can you actually start the program and actually uh, tell everybody how we actually completed this project? Spirit Skies, at its core, as Mr. Steven mentioned, is a graphic novel geared toward elementary and middle schoolers, and it focuses mainly on environmental stewardship. But it also serves as the cornerstone of a much more expansive project that incorporates international collaboration with Panama, educational outreach, and much, much more. But I'd like to start off this panel by asking Natalie to talk a little bit about the plot of Spirit Skies as a whole, because the plot of any graphic novel is one of the most integral parts of that novel. Yeah, sure. So um, as Mr. Steven said, we've been developing the plot of Spirit Skies for about five years now. And the story really begins with our protagonist, Jasper, who's a teenage boy of Kumeyaay heritage and his two close friends, John and Susie, traversing their hometown in San Diego. The town is suffering from an extreme drought and they're unaware of this, but Mother Nature is really fed up with the way the humans are treating their environment. When John and Susie decide to beat the San Diego heat with a hose by um, irresponsibly wasting water, Mother Nature decides that something must be done. Jasper's friends are transformed into cacti before his very eyes, and everyone else in the town is transformed as well. And the following day, he wakes up as a Rufus hummingbird. Wendy, a hummingbird messenger for Mother Nature, tells Jasper that he must travel the world in search of the remaining pieces of Mother Nature's talisman in order to save the environment and his friends. So this launches Jasper into an international quest where he travels first to Panama um, and he meets a variety of new friends and learns about the problems that plague our environment along the way. That's a really interesting plot and it looks like it has a lot of potential for further expansion both within and outside the novel. Mm -hmm. But could you elaborate a little bit more on the characters and names you mentioned like Jasper and uh, Wendy, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, definitely. So as I said before, our protagonist is named Jasper and um, he is really just an ordinary teenager who lives in Southern California in San Diego. And um, after he wakes up in the body of a hummingbird and his friends are turned to cacti, he's sent on this quest where he must travel along the Pacific Flyway, which Hannah will talk more about later, on a quest to save the environment. And then we have Wendy, who is uh, really the messenger for Mother Nature, who uh, kind of mediates between Jasper and Mother Nature and communicates to Jasper what his quest is and gives him guidance along the way. Um, so Wendy informs Jasper of what he can do to save his friends and uh, really guides him on his quest. 
and uh, John and Susie serve ma mainly as uh, the motivation for Jasper at the beginning of his quest as they're turned into cacti relatively early on and they show him the importance of um, preserving the environment and uh, motivate him to go on this quest for mother nature. And then we have a lot of other characters that Jasper meets along the way in his travels as he's traveling from San Diego to Panama to other areas. And um, we really try to make it so that the characters that he meets are uh, natural species in um, the regions that Jasper is in. So for example, one of the first characters that Jasper meets along the way is a coyote named Mai. And um, he meets Mai in San Diego. And um, as we know, coyotes are native to San Diego. Um, so we continue the theme of Jasper meeting native species along his journey throughout um, all the volumes of the graphic novel. So going back to what we mentioned a little bit previously with Panama International Collaboration, uh, Hannah, could you talk a little bit more about kind of why Panama is a collaboration in particular and especially how that kind of collaboration has directed the product as a whole? Hi, yeah, of course. Um, so our collaboration with Panama has really significantly enriched and strengthened our project. Panama City and uh, San Diego are already sister cities and Mr. Steven has contacts with several schools in Panama. We were able to work with Giovanna Agrazal, who will be speaking on this panel and who wrote volume two of the Spirit Skies graphic novel series. During the 2019 trip to Panama, we were able to meet with students at several different schools, including Escuela Homero Ayala, as well as present at the Biodiversity Museum Bill Museo. Our intention for the entire story was that Jasper, who was transformed, as we said earlier, into a Rufus hummingbird, follows the Pacific Flyway, which is a flight path for migratory birds running from Alaska to South America. Panama is the southernmost point of the Rufus hummingbird's flight path, so we thought that was the most important place to have on his journey. Panama is also an extremely biodiverse country and it's known as La Puente de Vida or the Bridge of Life. And so we thought it was an incredibly significant and important place to discuss the importance of nature and its preservation. So you mentioned a lot of different ways that Panama is kind of interconnected with both nature and the world at large. Has this interconnectivity made it into Spirit Skies of the project? And if so, what are the main ways that has kind of influenced the way the project has gone? Yeah, so the central theme that runs through Spirit Skies as a whole series and international project is the idea of global climate change. As Jasper travels from San Diego to Panama, he faces a variety of problems and issues such as drought and deforestation. The issues that are facing the planet are vast and varied, but they're interconnected and require unity. And I think, especially in the context of this pandemic, it's important to remember that we are all human and we are all facing the same problems and it's important to work together to find solutions. Yeah. So now it is my privilege to introduce Giovanna Agrazal, the high school student from Panama who wrote the second volume of Spirit Skies. Uh, hola Gio. Hola. Vamos a discutir tus preguntas. Okay. Okay. Um, así, ¿cómo te involucraste en este proyecto? Bueno, yo me involucré en este proyecto en mi antiguo colegio, entrando al club de ciencias llamado Los Verdes, que consistía en preservar y mantener el medio ambiente. Y entonces se hizo un concurso a través de Audubon, donde yo salí ganadora junto a la estudiante Sidney Olaya. Sí, ¿Y puedes describir el trama y los personajes de tu historia? Bueno, el trama de la historia es de mucha aventura, realismo y fantasía. Bueno, todo comienza cuando Jasper y Mai van a hacer un viaje hacia Panamá en busca de la madre naturaleza, pero antes de eso se encuentra con Fernando. Fernando es un iguana verde oriunda de Panamá, que pues es un personaje muy gracioso, va a estar la flor del Espíritu Santo que es una de las flores nacionales de aquí de Panamá, y el águila arpía, que es el ave nacional de Panamá, y otros personajes más. ¿Y puedes elaborar más en qué era tu inspiración para la historia? Bueno, me base, la inspiración de mi historia fue en la deforestación, ya que aquí en Panamá hay muchos lugares que están siendo destruidos, ya sea por los tablas de árboles, la contaminación, y yo quería hacer concientizar a la gente que debemos preservar nuestro medio ambiente, ya que son los lugares de muchos animales y especies. Sí, y al final, ¿cuál es la importancia de un proyecto global como Spirit Skies, especialmente en el tiempo de coronavirus? 
Bueno, para mí hay dos puntos muy importantes. Número uno, que lo que estamos viviendo son las consecuencias de nuestros actos. Así como en Spirit Sky, cuando Jasper, pues en la historia, la madre naturaleza convirtió a los humanos en cactus, es básicamente lo mismo que está pasando por, nuestro, por nuestros actos. Número dos, que a pesar de todo, no debemos rendirnos ante las adversidades. Debemos siempre mantener la esperanza, mantener la fe en nosotros y en Dios siempre. Ok, muchas gracias. Gracias. So far, we've mainly focused on the plot and cultural significance surrounding the project. But in most graphic novels, the art is just as important as the plot and writing. So Riley, could you talk a little bit about how the artistic collaboration has worked thus far and what you've learned over the years? Of course. As an artist on Spirit Skies, my focus has been different from that of my humanities counterparts because I've been approaching the project visually as opposed to writing first. But I think that's the virtue of Spirit Skies, both at CCA and internationally. The collaborative spirit enriches the graphic novel every time somebody new joins the team because they bring a new perspective. Artists don't take orders from writers and nor vice versa and editing is done with input from both sides which I think is super critical to how it's managed to develop over the years. And I've had the privilege of seeing this small scale and large scale because I had the privilege of going to Panama with my classmates to meet Giovanna and all her friends as both an illustrator and translator but what I discovered there above all is that the creative process manages to be its language all on its own and storytelling is such a universal thing in both visual and literary forms. Adding on to what Riley said regarding what we've learned, um, talking a little bit about the artistic technical process. For me personally, when I first joined the project three years ago, we were working on little revisions and so we've learned to use a spreadsheet formula to dictate which were beginning, medium, and more advanced edits. And we would work with humanities, let them know we were finished, and either via Slack or in person and they would give us some more edits and that's how the process worked. But lately these few years we've been adding more full chapters and pages to the comic book since we are getting ready to publish and we're filling any plot holes. And with this we've learned to let our artists kind of find their own way on how to improve since some artists feel more comfortable um, working on entire sections on their own whereas other artists would like to split up work between line art and coloring and storyboarding. And in addition to this we've had dozens of artists working on this project and it seems that having different art styles would actually uh, imp impede our project and seem a little incohesive but actually it's added on to the style of our art since it kind of shows us that since each art artist comes from a different background and brings a different perspective we're still telling the same story about environmental stewardship. In the rapidly evolving environment of COVID-19 and this uh, rapidly growing pandemic how has quarantine and other sorts of precautions taken change the way this artistic collaboration has gone? Has it made it easier or harder to make edits and revisions, etc.? Maybe Michaela, you could speak to that a little bit? As you know, Humanities was looking to publish a novel this year, so our goal as artists is more to just standardize pages because over the years we've had a lot of different artists work on this and this has made um, some of the pages look not so unified. So that was our original goal for this year, but then when the pandemic hit, uh, we actually were able to do a lot more than that because when the quarantine started, we ended up with a lot less academic responsibilities um, and that let us focus a lot more on the quality of the comic instead of just standardizing. Um, for example, me personally, usually I'd only be able to spend like two, maybe four hours um, during the week in a normal school environment. But then when I was in quarantine, I was spending somewhere around like seven hours a day in the comic. And then that let us really do something that might have taken a whole another school year um, and finish that all in just a couple of weeks. So putting two and two together, a logical next step for this graphic novel would focus on publication now that we've had sufficient time to revise the writing and also sufficient time to revise the art as well. Francis, could you talk a little bit about how that, how that process began and also how it's progressed thus far? Yeah, of course. So on the humanities side, we're very fortunate to have our guest artist, Betsy O'Neill, who is actually a professor of creative writing. So she has a lot of experience in this industry. And with her guidance, the first thing we did was come up with a log line and also a cover letter for publishers. And since, as it was mentioned earlier, it's a legacy project and has involved so many students over the years, 
it was a little difficult to compress all the work that has been done, as well as the plot of the Spirit Sky series into a single sentence. But the one that we were able to come up with is Spirit Skies is a project that invites high schoolers from all around the world to join us on a collaborative graphic novel series where Jasper, a teenage boy turned hummingbird, follows the Pacific Flyway on an adventure to save the environment. And the thing that was really crucial was that this one sentence, it gives just enough information about Spirit Skies while also lending itself well to more conversations. And something that was really important was for everyone on the team to be able to know this one sentence by heart because you never know the opportunities and people you're going to meet and it's really adaptable to any type of conversation, whether it's in a casual setting or a more formal setting, or whether it's a longer conversation or on a panel such as this one or like a shorter five minute conversation. I understand that a lot of this preparation has gone into log lines and finding a best way to kind of pitch the graphic novel in the most succinctly, succinct way possible. How have you used this, especially with regard to publishing houses? Um, for instance, if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, so in terms of like choosing the publishing houses, we had to develop a list and really put a lot of research into finding the right one for our mission. For example, one that we saw was one that focused on books celebrating nature and specifically its relationship with the people in the Southwest region. So we knew that that one really matched the mission of Spirit Skies. So we really want to further a relationship with that publishing house in particular. And then some had to be automatically taken off the list because they required either an agent or other resources that we just didn't have as students. And this whole process was a little bit daunting because there's underlying fear of rejection from every public uh, publishing house we sent our logline and cover letter to. And also kind of the thought of, oh, are we dreaming too big for who we are? Like we're just students. But, um, and all these houses have gotten emails from people who are far more qualified and experienced than we are. But at the same time, it's also a good reminder that anything can be doable and that when we first started this project, there were so many people doubting us. And the fact that now we're even talking about publishing is in itself a huge accomplishment. And uh, Izzy, do you want to speak more on the experience itself about reaching out to these major houses? Yes, so um, as Francis was talking about, Spirit Sky's major goal at the beginning of this year was to nail down our publishing. So um, our team, our publishing outreach team, set out to contact a variety of publishers such as um, Image Comics and Scholastic. And we did this via an email correspondence and tried to illustrate the goal of Spirit Skies and how it is a unique environmental educational tool for children. Um, however, we faced defeat in this area as many of our emails were met with rejections as many artists and writers face during their careers. Um, and due to our bad luck with major publishing houses, we decided to be best for the future of Spirit Skies if we aim to publish with local contacts. So what was the importance of using these local contacts? What are the benefits of doing so? How is, and how has it kind of changed the way publishing has progressed? Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, um, we did end up using local contacts and we are now hoping to publish Spirit Skies with Reflections Publishing, which is a San Diego-based publishing company that promotes books written and illustrated by kids for kids. Their mission statement is kids helping kids through books. And we believe this is going to give us an opportunity to create a support system within our own community for Spirit Skies, which would include um, a bigger opportunity for educational outreach for the project. And this is sort of a testament to one of our major goals, which is community, as seen with the generations of students working on this Hummingbird project. And we hope through our future publication with Reflections Publishing, it will lend itself to making our outreach efforts more successful. So you mentioned a little bit about uh, more educational outreach for the project as a result of these local contacts. Josh, could you kind of speak to a little bit about the plans for educational outreach in between the publication of the first volume and the second and how you plan to advance the Spirit Skies mission in regards to education? The Spirit Skies mission is fundamentally one of environmental stewardship. Uh, publishing a graphic novel is, is one of the best steps we can take to advance this goal. We want to publicize the concept, promote it as much as possible. In commercial distribution of a novel, doing that is just wonderful for the mission. But graphic novels take a lot of time. And yeah, between the volumes, there's a lot of work that can be done. So our primary goal, our primary role, is to reach out to the community in an educational and activist role. This will be the theme for the future until we can start to think about publishing the next volume. Uh, environmental stewardship can't be accomplished alone, and our mission to promote it echoes the entire basis of Spirit Skies, partnership and networking to spread our message. We'll start small with our local community and reach outwards, taking opportunities as they come and making them when they don't. Uh, local bookstores uh, like Diesel uh, offer a good uh, opportunity 
to promote the book through launch events, readings, and other uh, in-house uh, activities. Local schools and local environmental organizations like Santa Lee Hill Lagoon and Pacific Trails Middle School, which is right next to CCA, uh, also offer uh, good opportunities to get connected to our community and especially to students. And finally, bringing educational programs to local libraries is one of the best ways to do this. We've started a partnership with the Solana and Beach County Library, and we're looking to partner with the Carmel Valley Public Library. Libraries are a great place to reach, um, to reach lots of self-motivated kids, engaged parents, and kids whose schools simply don't cover the material in Spirit Skies, the graphic novel. Uh, environmental education uh, to younger students uh, and to uh, younger kids in general is increasingly as important as our environment deteriorates and these kids uh, grow up in an environment increasingly worse than the one that they previously existed in. So uh, we want to spread the message of Spirit Skies through as many mediums and outlets as possible. And we want to get kids excited about environmental stewardship. A graphic novel can help with that, but there's still a lot more we can do to develop uh, that feeling of excitement in our, um, in our students and uh, younger interested members. Given the current circumstances, however, how have these outreach efforts been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing quarantine? Okay, so I, as I kind of previously talked about, the goal is to introduce Spirit Skies as a graphic novel and then tie it back to its environmentalist message while simultaneously keeping our target audience engaged with whatever activities and stuff we can think of. So this approach will define the majority of material to develop to support Spirit Skies. Uh, the more graphic novels heard about, obviously, the better, and designing content around it really helps promote it and that and with that goal. To reach a younger audience, uh, uh, games, crafts, arts and crafts, that those kind of programs are necessary to retain engagement. Um, they get younger kids involved, and they get them excited, and they get them learning about the material in Spirit Skies. And in addition, these kind of activities are easier to publish independently and then promote later. To reach an older audience, we can uh, go directly into the scientific concepts in the book, and uh, can, we can hold more in-depth community outreach missions, uh, service projects, et cetera, if interest is um, present. Due to COVID-19, uh, outreach will have to be far more virtual. Videos, online classes, webinars, and other efficient methods of reaching a large audience online uh, will be obviously entailed. Asynchronous learning is another buzzword that we're, uh, that's going around in education, and we plan to capitalize on that as well by developing content that we can publish through our website uh, for more self-motivated learners for people who are looking to learn about environmental stewardship. And while the curricula, of course, will be based around Spirit Skies, it will source heavily from external research we've done into the science of environmental stewardship that has contributed to the graphic novel. And this research has been obviously focused on stewardship and conservation. And this is something Sarah has been very active in, if you'd like to ask her about this more. So um, this year, one of our goals was really going back to the educational um, focus of Spirit Skies. And uh, an important aspect of that was doing research into the real scientific material associated with the environmental stewardship message. And there are kind of two avenues through which we promoted that. One is the integration of scientific material into the graphic novel itself. So in the novel itself, while information is not explicitly presented in a textbook format or an info dump kind of way, the circumstances which drive the plot in all of the novels um, stem from real environmental issues, such as drought or deforestation, with the art and characters representing actual species and their characteristic behaviors. So the scientific aspect of the novels is introduced subtly and in a way that makes it accessible and interesting to more kids. And um, as one of the focuses was definitely research this year, uh, we also looked at the ways that real science could further be integrated into the Spirit Skies project beyond just the novels. Can you elaborate a little bit more on, those on how you've developed those educational aspects beyond the novel? Yeah, one of the most special things about Spirit Skies and what sets it apart is that we strive to make it more than just a graphic novel. So not only is it a series of um, novels, it is also an educational tool that tackles cultural and environmental issues. And the expansion of the scientific aspect first um, happens through the publication of information on the website. So we did a lot of research this year and a lot of time was spent compiling all these facts and figures and information relevant to different aspects of the environmental aspect of the novel. 
and now we're publishing that that information on the website in a format which makes it uh, easily accessible to anyone interested. Um, additionally, this has been really, really important due to um, obviously COVID-19 and the new emphasis on distance learning. So having everything in a virtual space has also made it a lot more relevant. Um, also, the aforementioned outreach programs are going to be a way to uh, focus on this educational and scientific aspect of the project. Um, and something that we're still working on is finding the best way to make the information accessible and interesting to everyone who encounters it, as well as continuously updating it, because science is definitely not static. So one of the goals is to foster the organic connection between the artistry of the novel and the message of environmental stewardship and, and cultural awareness that it carries. So a methodology for furthering this connection and spreading the messages involved is to make it interesting for everyone. Um, whether they enjoy learning about plants indigenous to different parts of the world and their properties or factors influencing a severe drought or the nuances of various world cultures. We want to have something for everyone um, so that it is a valuable experience for all. Yeah, and you know, just as Sarah spoke to our major effort this year to incorporate the scientific background of the plot in a more um, obvious but also fun way, there's also been a big push this year to bring Jasper's Kumeyaay heritage back in the book. So Jasper was originally conceived as um, a character of Kumeyaay heritage because that heritage ties him to the land in San Diego and in many ways encapsulates one of the central missions of Spirit Skies, which is to show people how efforts on a local level uh, ties to the local environment um, and local issues can be fought uh, on a global scale and have global consequences. So his Kumeyaay heritage ties him back to the local environment. And in that regard, we, we wanted to bring it back in because it had sort of been lost over the years. Um, and so to do this, we did quite a bit of research and then reached out to um, members of the Kumeyaay community at Kumeyaay Community College uh, and elsewhere in search not only of a sensitivity reader to make sure that the content we were trying to reincorporate um, sort of as his backstory um, was not insensitive. And more than that, though, to make sure that their valuable perspective was introduced and that we had a partner in that community, which is important to the book itself, considering that um, Jasper is a member of it. But we still have a lot of work to do because this year we haven't been able to establish that contact firmly. And um, we're by no means giving up. So we're, we're still striving to make contact and um, hopefully they can be a part of the project in the future. One last thing I thought maybe John, you could elaborate on a little bit more was about the future plans of the project. Where do you see Spirit Skies taking off from here? Yeah, sure. So uh, a number of people spoke about volume two in Panama. Uh, Giovanna wrote that, um, but it still needs to be illustrated. So a major effort going forward is going to be getting art for that done and, and readying it for publication, much like volume one. And beyond that, we want to expand Spirit Skies to other schools. Um, much like we reached out to Panama and Giovanna because it was along the Pacific Flyway of the hummingbirds, uh, we also want to take Spirit Skies to the Pacific Northwest or even up to Alaska. And really, the opportunities are boundless. The, one of the main messages we want to get across with this panel is being part of Spirit Skies is something anyone can do. So we want to make sure that, you know, Spirit Skies is open to anyone along that flyway who wants to participate. But not only that, more so that a project like this uh, over the course of five and I'm sure many more years involving artists, writers, all kinds of creative minds, students, teachers, um, people from different countries. This is something that, you know, whatever the resources of your school, we want to encourage you to try out. I can't speak enough to how much this has enriched all our lives and also, you know, how easy it is to do despite how daunting it might appear. We want to encourage anyone uh, who would be interested in joining us in Spirit Skies, reaching out to us, going to our website, emailing us. And beyond that, anyone who might be interested in doing a similar project, we encourage you to pursue it. So that concludes the majority of our panel, but because this panel is being held in a more virtual format, we wanted to take this time to answer a few of the most frequently asked questions that we've gotten in our previous Q&A sessions in the past. 
And one of the biggest questions that we've always been asked is, what is the most enjoyable part of working on this project? What's really fun about it? And Alex, maybe if you could speak to that and what you found the most fun about working on Spare Skies over these past few years. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for me, at least, it was definitely the visit we made to Panama in March of last year. Uh, being able to meet so many amazing people, having so many unexpected and enriching experiences, and being able to see the world from a new perspective really reminded me of what this project is all about in the first place, uh, emphasizing the things that unite all people. Uh, regardless of where we're from, we all share this uh, We all share this earth together and the health and wellness of our planet is something that affects every single human being, irrespective of their, uh, their race, nationality, place of origin. Uh, by emphasizing the ecological, environmental threads that uh, bind us all together and the importance of maintaining those things, uh, what Spirit Skies does is that it reaffirms that we're really all in this together. Uh, going to Panama really proved that even more and that's what made it so fun. Talking to the students at uh, Omero Ayala School in Panama City, for example, uh, even though we didn't speak the same language and we came from very different backgrounds, it was clear how much we really have in common. We all care about our earth, we all care about the, the happiness and survival of our fellow human beings, and uh, we, all, you know, we're all, we all look very optimistically to, to the time when we can do our very best to make the world a better place. And uh, going to Panama was an amazing reminder of all of those things, and that's what made it definitely the funnest part of the project, as well as uh, uh, an amazing reminder of some very important truths. Thank you so much, Alex. And one of the other questions that has been very frequent in our question and answer sessions after the panels has been how the project was sustained over a very long period of time. I believe we touched on this a little bit over the previous questions and how the legacy aspect is something that is very important in Spirit Skies. So maybe John, if you could talk about how you've managed to carry on the project identity over such a long period of time. As you said, it's a legacy project. And because of that, there are a whole host of challenges to sustaining a project like Spirit Skies. Uh, continuity, organization, and I think especially authenticity to original intents. So ultimately taking part in such a project means embracing all the discontinuities and all the changes as part of the creative process. And to celebrate them, I think, as the core of any good collaboration. Instead of finding fault in the patchwork art styles, I think we've all come to recognize them as a symbol of the monumental effort Spirit Skies became over time, and of the different voices who've all contributed to its success. Staying true to the initial intent is important, and we strive to do so. Uh, and I think our efforts this year with the Kumeyaay and uh, what Sarah talked about um, as far as you know, making it more educational uh, have really demonstrated that. But I think at the same time, it's equally important to accept that projects and people change and things can be malleable. So what began as an idea to revamp the children's zoo has become an international graphic novel. The point being a project of this scale can be sustained only through a real embrace of change and all its consequences. Thank you so much. With that, I think that is the last one of the most frequently asked questions that we've gotten. And with that, Mr. Steven, would you like to close out the panel? Yeah, I just want to thank the audience for coming. It's really important for you to come and, and share in what we've done. We really want to partner with you. And if you're really interested in starting a project like this, we really want you to be able to do that. Our contact information is spiritskies.org and the humanities uh, website is envisionhumanities.net. So after this, please go outside, see the wildlife that's in your backyard, see the, the hummingbird, and thanks so much for coming. Bye, everybody.